What's going on, y'all? Back at you again here. Uh, you got me, you got Noah, no Nick. I don't know what he's doing. Probably crying about the Falcons losing Dan Quinn as his, his hometown hero. Um, Did he but, just get signed, Dan Quinn? Yeah, he, he got signed in uh, Dallas. So, I mean, their defense stunk, so it doesn't get much worse But uh, until you sign Dan Quinn. So I'm sure it will get worse. I put out a tweet actually the other day. I said, you know, the Legion of Boom to Dan Quinn is basically what Peyton Manning is to Adam Gase. You know, they the, <laughs> Dan yeah, Quinn is living him. off that He's fame, still jobs off and him. Adam Gase is living off that fame, and they're just getting they just keep getting jobs uh, for it. Even though uh, you know, if we're talking real here, they don't really deserve it. I mean, Falcons defense was was buns, and then actually got bad got better after Dan Quinn got fired. Yeah, did they not so, realize like Raheem Morris was kind of the one that when he took over their defense got better? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't know why Dan Quinn still gets the hype, but I mean, look, man, you, it's like one of those things in the football circle, you know, a lot of nepotism. And then just like that one hit wonder, you got, you get yourself attached to like a really good name, like hall of fame caliber players. And it's like, wow, that guy, that coach is the reason why Peyton Manning is the way that he was like, that guy is the reason why yeah. Legion of Boom was one of the best defenses of all time. It's it's because of him, not because of the hall of fame caliber players that he had, but anyways, enough about Dan Quinn and how much he stinks. Uh, you know, it's a, not much going on in the, in the, in the fantasy world right now, obviously, because it's, it's playoff time. Fantasy season's already over. Uh, but you know, I really, really like to pay attention during these times. And I've said it over and over again. I think the playoff games matter and should matter just as much as any regular season game, if not more, because from a player's perspective, I mean, that's, what's important. The teams are showing you all of their cards, uh, putting all on the table, you know, one, one win for everything, uh, for their life. So you got to pay attention. You know, we're paying attention. Uh, I know Noah's paying attention, but that's not what it's all about, man. This week, we're going to talk about some some mock draft, rookie mock drafts. And, um, you know, Noah, I'm going to kick it over to you, man. What have you, you been up to with lately? Uh, lately, I just got a dog, so I haven't been sleeping too much. She's been sleeping <laughs> in my room, and it's just – my room's a mess. I'm not sure if you can tell, but it's because she's been in here. So apologies for the backdrop and uh, me not being so – eloquent with my words maybe with, due to the lack of sleep but I can't really complain because Mike's working like fucking 27 hours a day so I have no excuses here as far as football goes Mike's right you should be looking at what's happening throughout the playoffs I will say though if you're trying to make a trade for like a running back that's in the playoffs right now I probably would be hesitant to do so like a Nick Chubb like an Aaron Jones because if they do get injured their value plummets and if they do well we already know these guys are good so their value isn't going to really skyrocket all too much so that's just like one tip, but I think we're seeing Baker Mayfield kind of come into his own in the Cleveland Browns system. Like they're not asking to do too much. And when uh, Odell isn't on the field, this offense just seems to be really good and he's becoming a better quarterback and he's progressing kind of like how we expected him to, you know, he came off like to that huge hot start as a rookie set those rookie records for touchdowns kind of fell off and then some bad weather games here and there, but he's looked great. And I think just the playoffs as, as a whole was a great weekend. Aside from like the whole Nickelodeon thing, I tried to watch it and they're like, it's a football. Look at the shape of a football. You score a touchdown. That's six points. They kick it through the uprights that look like the outline of SpongeBob. That's an extra one. I'm like, all right, Nate Burleson. It's like America's game. You got to chill out. We understand what six plus one is and all that stuff. But other than that, yeah. Wait, what channel did you watch football that on? And a good weekend overall. What, what channel did you watch that on? It was on Nickelodeon. Oh, I was trying to find it. I couldn't find it. Like that, I saw they had like the sludge thing. I saw they had like when players hit each other. It had like the little like wind like animation that came out. Really, I watched Drew maybe Brees. like five minutes of it, and then they were just oh. like, I just saw it, on Twitter. The like, analogies yeah. that they were drawing to like try to reel in kids was just like it was terrible. I wasn't yeah. a fan. Well, uh, I mean, they gave uh, Mitchell Trubisky the Nickelodeon uh, valuable player, and when I saw MVP, I just thought of like not valuable player because Mitch Trubisky actually stinks. But he won the vote at like halftime or something. Like, he, didn't, <laughs> he hadn't done anything. Yeah, Bears had eleven first downs. I mean, that offense sucks with uh, with everyone, but you know, with at least it's better than with Nick Foles. Man, Nick Foles was worse than Mitch Trubisky. Didn't think it was possible. Hey, but hey, you know, he's a, he's a dreamer and he did it. Nick Foles accomplishing things that most of us mortals don't think is possible. But man, you know, speaking of the Browns Steelers game, man, how satisfying was that to watch watch Ben Ben Rapelisberg or just get stomped uh, by the Browns 28 nothing. What do you um, think that was the fact that that happened during the game or like after the game Chase Claypool was like the Browns are going to get clapped. I'm like how are you so butthurt? How do you have any competitive so... spirit that you just like completely dismiss that you got throttled? By a team that yeah. you didn't think like had any chance against you, beat twice in the regular season. Or no, they've lost a second time because they're playing backups. Yeah. But they they just throttled you. Like 
thoroughly and you're like, it's okay, they're gonna get clapped next week. If they don't get clapped next week, Chase Claypool is off my boards forever. This guy is cursed. I don't want any piece of this Pittsburgh Steelers receiving court. Hopefully Juju leaves, but it just seems like all the Pittsburgh Steelers do. I tweeted out, they draft good receivers, but then the receivers that they draft also suck on social media. So I'm not a fan of any of them, <laughs> except Deontay Johnson, but it's probably because he can't even hold on to his phone because he drops everything. So uh, other than him, I mean, everybody on social media, that's in the Pittsburgh area, all those yinzers, whatever they call themselves. I would just advise maybe staying off of Facebook Live and Twitter and trying to justify your losses by saying they're going to get clapped by another divisional opponent. Yeah. Listen, like you, when you get clapped and you lose, you lose the right, you forfeit the right to talk shit uh, because you have zero credibility. You just got to take that L and just chew on it for the offseason. Hopefully, motivate yourself, come back better. Uh, but yeah, just uh, pretty sad, pathetic showing uh, by the Steelers, both on the field and off the field. Uh, what do you expect, man? Just an over emotional team. I mean, can't wait for all the big mad Steelers fans to hop in the comments. Y'all suck. I don't care. Uh, let's move on. I'm going to go go on to the first, first ever, not the first ever, the first rookie mock draft of the 2021 season uh, between Noah and myself. We have our own rankings. We're kind of going to go back and forth. The settings are simple. It is a super flex, uh, super flex draft because one QB drafts are boring as shit. Uh, if you don't, play in super flex drafts try it out man try it out maybe 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 you'll like it i'm 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 betting that you will like it because it creates a lot of good trade opportunities for you and for those who don't know like all that means is that you have a flex spot where you can start a running back wide receiver tight end or a quarterback and in most instances you want to start two quarterbacks because uh quarterbacks for the most uh pretty much in any any scoring format unless your name is like christian mccaffrey and dalvin cook so so make sure you guys explore that path, and you know we'll be tossing up a bunch of them in the Big Dogs, uh, Big Dogs League Discord. Uh, we'll be tossing up like I bet I bet you we'll put up like two hundred startups this this off season. We put up like one. Oh, easily. Last I think year. we did one fifty last year, and we had yeah. like maybe a thousand members for the majority of it. We're up to like around three thousand. Yeah, and we only started like there. we only started in like April last year or something like that. So we're gonna we're gonna kick those up soon, and then that'll help us create ADP as well for you guys. Uh, so yeah, no one I'll go back, but you know, the important thing here is like, like I've always said, man, mock drafts are a fucking waste of time. But the reason why I want to do it is because we can talk about some of the players, how we think about them relative to each other. We're Noah. I differ. Uh, I probably have a sense for where some of that is, but you know, that those are the interesting discussions we want to get into this episode. Uh, but before we do that, man, what time is it? Time to hit that intro. <laughs> All right. So who's going first? You want to go first? I mean, you can go first. I can go first. I don't really care. I think we'll have the same one on one, but I'll I'll let you go first, Mike. I'll let you kick it off with our our golden boy. All right. So uh, at the one on one, we got Kyle Trask. I'm I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Kyle man, Trask, I don't think Kyle Trask is <laughs> 24. I don't want that man at all. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Not not Kyle Trask. It's I mean the the decision is obvious. I'm sure there will be some spicy takes out there, guys talking about you know picking Zach Wilson or or Trey Lance, or what have you. And I trust me, I like both those players as well. But the decision here is Trevor Lawrence, football Jesus. He plays like a god, looks like Jesus. Uh, I mean, there's not much to not like about this kid. Won the national championship as a true freshman. Uh, just a stud. I mean, he made, you know, T. Higgins. Well, he had T. Higgins. You know, he had uh, Justin Ross at the time. Uh, basically, the two twin towers and just, he lit college football blaze. They're blowing teams out like nobody's business. And like, if you're in a super flex league, like normally, like last year, like we advocated for taking like a Jonathan Taylor over, you know, the Joe Burrows and the Tua Tagovailoa's because we felt like those running backs were just like absolute, like you can't miss studs. I don't think we have that this year. And even more importantly, even if we did, like Trevor Lawrence is being touted as the greatest quarterback prospect of all time. Now I'm not a quarterback whisperer. I'm not a quarterback expert, but a lot of the guys I trust in film do say that he's really good, but more importantly for me, he has the Konami code and I've covered the Konami code a lot. You know, just cause he's white doesn't mean he can't run. Um, you know, he's not, I don't know, Mike, you check the analytics on that, the correlation. <laughs> being yeah, I'll, have to, I'll, have to do, I'll have to check the R squared on being white and run fast. I'm sure it's really <laughs> low, but this is an outlier. I'm willing to bet on uh, Trevor Lawrence is an absolute stud with, as a passer, from all things I've read, he's a very intelligent and high football IQ player. Uh, but most importantly, he's also very athletic. Very similar to Justin Herbert. I mean, Justin Herbert was was freaking athletic. 
um, when he came out of the combine. I'm expecting very similar things for Trevor Lawrence, but Trevor Lawrence is a better runner than Justin Herbert is. I mean, in college, if you guys watch the games, I mean, he's quite effective as a dual threat QB. I mean, him and Justin Fields went head to head in the elite 11 competition. I've been tracking both these guys since high school. Um, and Justin Fields actually ended up winning the MVP, but just Trevor Lawrence was number two. That's not, doesn't really impact my ranks, but just to show you how, how big of a stud these guys are, serial winners ever since they were uh, in high school. But yeah, I mean, I love the Konami code. Uh, the analogs are there for him. Um, he's an absolute stud, serial winner, and there's just not much not to like. And he's basically locked in at the 101. I don't think we're going to see any surprises here uh, when it comes to draft time. You never know. There's always that chance. There's always that chance that Jacksonville is like, nope, fuck that. I'm taking Trey Lance. Uh, but chances are like 90 nine percent is going to be trevor lawrence so draft capital check age check production check every he checks every single box so there's not much of a discussion here for me i don't know if you have anything else to add but yeah all i'm gonna one. say is like it's the same thing as joe burrow last year where we were mocking way before the nfl draft this is the only player on the board where we basically have a 99 percent chance of knowing where he's going to land and him going to jacksonville is probably one of the better quarterback situations you could hope for i know last year of the top three with tua justin herbert joe burrow I personally thought Justin Herbert landed in the best spot with the weapons and the fact that they had a pretty solid offense and ended up turning out that way. He produced because of that. Trevor Lawrence going to Jacksonville is going to only do him a lot of favors. Gardner Minshew this year, quarterback 13 on a point per game basis, only having 17 or only putting off 17 rushing yards a game. So he didn't even fully display his Konami code abilities like a Trevor Lawrence will be able to do. I wouldn't be surprised this kid runs like four sevens and he just, he seems like a smart kid that's not going to want to take big hits but has the ability to get out of the pocket and scramble. On top of that, Jacksonville, we know they have Lewis Chanel, DJ Chark, uh, James Robinson out of the backfield, who just seems to be replaced already, even though he is the guy and he's an animal. They also have two first-round picks, two second-round picks, and the most cap in the NFL. All that tells me is they got a lot of pieces to build around this guy. We know he's talented. We know he can run. We know he can throw. It's it's not really that hard to put him at the 101 because it's it's simple as animal would say. You can throw, you can run, you got weapons around you, and you're good at football. I'll take you 101 every single day of the week. I, I'm sure some people like Trey Lance. I think Kyle Yates had a 101. That's cool and all. I mean, I'll, I'll just take the guy who's been compared to Andrew Luck and compared to Aaron Rodgers ever since he was like 12 years old and has done nothing to stray away from those opinions. Now, at the 102, Mike, this may be where we differ because I'm going – Najee Harris running back out of Alabama the the thing about Najee Harris is when I watch this kid play I know he's a little bit older he's me 23 as a rookie I only really I and I think you said all the time I yeah basically 30 I think he already retired without making it to the NFL <laughs> the thing that I only care about and I think you bring it up as well is like you just want these guys to play at their rookie deal and I think with the season that he put up he's probably gonna be a first round pick which means the team is going to have five years to hold them onto their books. Maybe a team doesn't want to bring them back when he's 28 years old, 29 years old, that offseason when the fifth year option is, is exercised on him. But I think those first four or five years, however long he stays in that situation, is going to be very lucrative. And I know having a guy like Justin Fields, who I'm sure is going to be the next pick, is going to be popular at the 102. And if you are in need of a quarterback, I'd probably take him. But in, in a vacuum, I just think the chances of a guy like Najee Harris with his skill set, a true three down guy who is extremely good catching the ball out of the backfield, who has shown to be a really good goal line back. I just think that his skill set will translate directly into the NFL. And we've seen guys like JK Dobbins and guys like uh, Jonathan Taylor, even James Robinson, who didn't have the draft capital. There's basically seven running backs this year who could be argued as top 12 dynasty running backs and have fallen now into like the first or second round of startup drafts. Whereas a guy like Justin Fields for as good as he is, even like a Justin Herbert, is he a locked in first round startup pick? He might be yeah. on that fringe where I think Najee Harris, if he does what I think he can do, and that's almost match what Jonathan Taylor did this year. Now he's not going to have the same hype as Jonathan Taylor coming in because the athleticism isn't there and the overall pedigree might not be up to snuff. But if he goes out there, puts up like 1,200 to 1,400 yards from scrimmage, double digit touchdowns and lands in a good spot like a Miami or Pittsburgh, I have no doubts that he's going to be somebody who can return value for you down the road. And it, it just goes without saying, obviously, like we, we need the combine, we need the draft capital, we need all this stuff to iron it out. But as it stands right now, I'm just, I'm banking on Najee Harris because I know Ray says it all the time. His comp for him is Matt Forte. I honestly see like Alvin Kamara plus like 30 pounds. Like he's so elusive for how big he is. He's a great pass catcher, not as good as Alvin Kamara as a receiver. But I mean, for his size and his elusiveness and his power, the only thing he lacks maybe is long speed. But we've seen plenty of running backs like, 
Christian McCaffrey and Kamara and Ezekiel, they're not burners. And Najee Harris might be slower than all of them, but I think what he does well is he, he's a lead at. And I think that's going to more than make up for the lack of 4-4 four, four speed. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't hate that decision at all. I think, but I will say, I think Justin Herbert's already locked in on like first round sort of pick. I think he's probably a top ten pick in most so. of the mocks that I'm seeing him do. Um, and I think he'll he'll land there. He'll be like a top five QB. I think. I think people are going to overcorrect on quarterbacks this year, and I, I talked about this in the offseason already. But I think that like because of how how well the quarterbacks did this year, right? In this like weird COVID uh, non-prep off season. And, and the last most comparable time to this was when we had like the lockout and it was a similar type of thing. Like scoring was lights out, like defense couldn't keep up. And I think people are going to see the quarterback scoring and going to remember the pain of not having a top quarterback and realize like, oh, I need to go in on quarterback at Superflex, especially. So I think a lot of the mocks I see and a lot of what, I, what I'm going predicting I'll see in the, in the offseason is going to be a lot of quarterbacks going in the first round. You're going to see Justin Herbert going top 10. You're going to see Mahomes, Kyler, uh, Josh Allen, all these guys fly off in the first round and, and you know probably in the early part of the first round. So uh, I do think there is that upside for a quarterback. I won't be chasing that per se, uh, but I think the value upside – uh, will be there. So, you know, I love Najee too. I mean, he he's he's incredible as a uh, as a running back. And the age factor, I I really don't think it's as big of a deal for running backs as it is for uh, wide receivers, um, because of like those those reasons you mentioned. Um, but also, if he gets draft capital, right? like draft capital is, is is king. Like that's gonna dictate the opportunity that he gets as an NFL running back. Is there and any you know he's between like out. senior declare and running backs, or is that just for wide receivers? Because I was going to say, like, you look at his competition with, like, Bo Scarborough, Josh Jacobs, and uh, Damian Harris, like, you can really rationalize away the fact that he wasn't great his first two years. Uh, yeah, I just don't think it's as significant. Like, obviously, like, all else equal, you would rather have mm-hmm. a younger guy, right? You'd rather have a 21-year-old rookie. Uh, but if he gets the draft capital, right, I think that that kind of put that kind of solves a lot of the problems for us. Like, if he gets first-round draft capital, that would be huge. I personally don't think any of these running backs are worth first-round picks, but who the fuck knows? Like, NFL teams are stupid, so maybe they, they do take him with a first-round pick. But even if he gets second-round draft capital, that's still pretty solid. Uh, but he does, like you said, he is versatile. He is the most landing spot independent uh, back in this class, I think. Uh, just given his skill set. And you know he's going to get that Alabama premium. You know he's going to get that freaking national championship premium. All these Alabama players are hard. Like, you get that. You win the national championship. You're on the big stage. And the scouts are going to freaking fall in love. And they're going to just, like, jack up whatever whatever they loved about you. They love about it even more, man. It's it's, it's like it's like uh, the national championship, you know, is kind of like drunk goggles. You know, you, you get fucking smashed when you go out with your boys. And, you know, when you first get to the bar, you look at that girl and she's like, eh, eh, don't think so. But then, like, 10 beers later, and you got the beer goggles on with your buddies. Hey, bro, and, I'm gonna go over there real quick. <laughs> and they got the cheerleader effect going on when you got multiple people. Uh, if you guys don't know what the cheerleader effect is, when like each individual person is not necessarily like that good looking, when you put them all together, uh, it creates a cheerleader effect. So that's what it is. So the cheerleader effect plus the beer goggles. You know, you're ten beers deep, and you're like, "Fuck, let me go over there and uh, try my chances," because you've swung and missed on everybody when you were sober. That's kind of what the national champion is gonna be like when it comes to Alabama and all the scouts. They are going to overvalue it. Like I, I, and I saw that game by Devon Smith. I tweeted it was fucking incredible. One of the best games ever, right? Did that move my ranks? Not even a bit because these single games are not really going to impact uh, my rankings that much. But it will impact it for scouts and it will impact it for Najee Harris and it will impact it for draft capital, which I do absolutely care about because that's where you get the volume as running backs. I don't hate that. I don't hate that at all. Um, but uh, this leaves me a great value at, at 102. I'm just going to pick my guy, Justin Fields. Uh, and I'm, you know what, I'm glad that he didn't go lights out this week. I mean, uh, if this, if this performance against Alabama plus the Northwestern performance allows me to get him at a value, I think I'm happy to do that. Um, you know, people are going to go for that, that spiciness and get a Zach Wilson, get a Trey Lance above him. I'm not there. Justin Wilson. I mean, sorry, Justin Fields has been winning at basically every stage in, in uh, his career. The only inexplicable part is when Georgia decided to play Jake Fromm over him, forcing him to leave to go to OSU, but he's been balling ever since. Does he have weaknesses? Absolutely, he does. I'm sure he does, you know. Um, but he has the Konami code, and he is a better passer than I think people give him credit for. Uh, so I'm a big fan of Justin Fields in the Superflex format, uh, and he's going to – I don't I don't know if he'll go to the Jets. Maybe the Jets will get too wise and smart with it and, like – not pick a quarterback and try and go with Sam Darnold. Who the fuck knows? But it looks like they're probably going to land with the Jets. Um, but, you know, it's not not the worst thing. They have a decent amount of weapons. Uh, you know, they 
they're kind of building up that offensive line. So I'm just going to swing here and uh, grab my guy, Justin Fields. I'm assuming he has draft capital too. Uh, if, you know, if, if he drops in the draft for some reason and, you know, like NFL teams really start taking Zach Wilson or Trey Lance, like well ahead of him, then I might reconsider because draft capital, you know, does really matter. And that's one adjustment I will be making this year after the Justin Herbert. Yeah, it's like the um, Dwayne Haskins and Josh Rosen effect too, where like you expect them to go yeah. top five a piece and then they fell down and we saw what happened in their careers. Yeah, so I'm definitely going to pay attention to Jack Cattle. But as of now, I'm assuming he's going to get the pick. I'm going number three, Justin Fields. Yeah, I mean, it's it's simple again. Uh, I think it's the same thing with Trevor Lawrence, right? They're both really good with their arm. And I think a lot of people may expect Justin Fields to be a better runner than he is thrower for probably obvious reasons. I don't think that's the case. I think a lot of the comps to Cam Newton, to me at least, seems more size-wise. Because Justin Fields is like 6'3", 230. He's a physical runner, which kind of hurt him in the game leading up to the national championship. He took that big hit to the ribs. He didn't look 100%, but they still blew Clemson the fuck out. So I think that... You know, if you take Cam Newton's arm talent and leg talent or running ability and you flip how good he is relative to each other, I think Justin Fields is a better thrower than he is runner, but he can definitely do both. He's averaging 39.4 rushing yards a game over the last two years, which is basically a passing touchdown worth. And you also got to take into account in college football, the stats that they keep, you get negative yards for sacks taken. So it's probably going to be higher than that at the next level or around there, because I think obviously the competition is better. Guys are faster going to tackle you a little bit easier than Ohio State defense or defenses that Ohio State is facing are going to. But as you said, it's a pretty simple pick when you have a dual threat Konami code quarterback who is going to likely have the draft capital. And if he doesn't, and he slips to a team like Carolina, even better because I'd rather have someone in Carolina than the New York Jets. So that's a great pick at number three. And number four is where I kind of got iffy because you can't take a quarterback here, but I feel like they're really not worth it. You can take a wide receiver here, but I just feel like it's so hard to pass up on a running back that I really think has three down ability. And that's Javante Williams out of UNC. The concern here is the fact that he never really led his backfield. He was never really running away with a job, but that was also a concern with like Josh Jacobs. And we saw how that turned out in the NFL. Uh, He he shared a backfield with Michael Carter, who is a very good running back in his own right. But I think what Javante Williams has shown is like, he's just, he's basically Kareem Hunt. Like he's a pretty stocky dude. Who's a great pass catcher has elite contact balance, whatever you want to call that. Uh, He's, he's a big, big physical runner. And I just don't see too many holes in his game. I think if Najee Harris wasn't in this class, and obviously me taking him directly behind Najee Harris uh, tells you that I would think that he would be the number one if Najee Harris wasn't there. But I think the difference between Najee Harris and Javante Williams isn't really all too big of a gap. Uh, It's definitely a smaller gap between those two than it is like ETN and the number four running back in this class. And, you know, there are the concerns that he's playing at UNC and they don't face good competition. But if you like Travis ETN, they're in the same conference. They're both in the ACC. They play the same competition. Uh, obviously, and we like Cam Akers. Yeah, Cam Akers too. But Cam Akers averaged five rushing yards, uh, five yards <laughs> carry behind that offensive line. And obviously, Javante Williams has benefited a little bit by having Sam Howell and having uh, Daz Newsom and Diami Brown stretching the field. But when you watch this kid play, I mean, I'm not exactly sure what he's going to run in the 40. That obviously remains to be seen. Hopefully he doesn't turn into Zach Moss, this PFF darling who breaks a bunch of tackles and catch out of the backfield, but runs a four, six and tears his hamstring clean off the bone while doing a vertical jump. If he is anything more athletic than a Zach Moss, which I don't doubt because these eyes, they watch film. And I think he's a little bit more <laughs> bursty and busty or whatever you want to call it than a guy like Zach Moss, who I think the, the comp for him last year was kind of a, a Jamal Williams because he could kind of do it all but he wasn't anything that was jumping off the screen I think the difference is Javante Williams is a lot more physical he's willing to invite contact which you may or may not like depending on if you want your running back to last more than like three years but I think he is more of a breakaway runner than him because he has the burst to get to the edge that's not to say he's gonna run a 4-3 or low 4-4s but I think he could be in that 4-5 range and if he does hit those numbers and he gets anything within day one or day two draft capital which is also kind of a worry because I think he's in the slide under the radar in comparison to a Najee Harris or Travis Etienne but if he goes anything earlier than like day three day two or somehow day one then I'm gonna be all in because he just seems to be a three down guy and that's what you want and that's going to return uh, the most on your investment in these rookie drafts. Yeah, I, I have him there as well at the 1.04. It's really just come down to draft capital again. Um, like I, I like all three of these running backs, right? But I would not rank any of them ahead of a Jonathan Taylor, ahead of a Cam Akers, ahead of a J.K. Dobbins. I would take all the most of the 2020 uh, tier one, tier two running backs over these guys. So 
that's just one thing to note. You know, we're just comparing within the class right now, so it's harder to see that. I'll kind of release my like combined class rankings, and you'll kind of see uh, some of those views that I have. Uh, but yeah, I do. I do love Javante Williams. I mean, he is he is gonna be that darling, right? You, you know, you know, like th- every year there's one of these guys, right? It's Devon, it's David Montgomery last year, uh, the year before last year. It's it's Zach Moss last year. Uh, you know, the PFF darling, uh, the ball blast some darling, uh, hey, and, like and, and the, the like, yeah, the, the the traditional mold of like tackle breaking monster. I I I have not watched as much. Uh, film on him yet uh but in the limited amount that i have seen he does seem like he's a little bit more <coughs> God damn bless you. Yeah. Justin Herbert, bless you. <laughs> excuse me but uh it does seem like he's got a bit more burst than david montgomery and certainly more than zach moss who who we said i mean we said without even the combine we're like dude this guy runs like he's in he's running in mud okay so uh, Javante Williams does definitely seem like a little bit more athletic than that. I would love to see him run in the four fives. A low four fives would be great. A mid four five, you know, high four five. As long as it's like not like a four six seven or like a you know a four seven, like not like a what's it Elijah Holyfield Man, type of combine. Sucked. Dad had hands. He had no legs. That was crazy. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully he does get that. I do like that pick. But I mean, that makes my my choice not very easy to be honest. And this is a battle that I think I'm gonna fight with. Uh, and you know, just based on positional value here, I think I'm probably going to have to go with like a Travis Etienne here. And that's, that's who I will go with. Uh, but Travis Etienne, the, the problem with him is he is not a workhorse back. Uh, he is not going to be, at least not to me, uh, unless he has like a Jamal Charles type ascension in the NFL. He just doesn't seem like the type of guy that's going to go in there and be a workhorse out the gate. So his landing spot is really important to me. You know, I think, I said this before, but I think like landing in Fort in the San Francisco 49ers would be a beautiful, beautiful match for him where even if he's part of a committee, as long as he leads that committee, they run enough for him to get enough volume. And, you know, they Shanahan will dial up enough open book, like home run plays for him to swing and hit you. Because if you give Travis Etienne space, he will absolutely kill you. Right. But if you take him and drop him in a shitty team with a shitty O-line, it's going to be very problematic. So his landing spot, his ranking for me is probably the most volatile to landing spot out of anyone in the first round. Like I could see him. Like, I think the Jets are going to use their Seattle pick on Travis Etienne, and that's going to fuck up his value real bad. Oh man, that would be that would be not ideal. That would be very very not ideal if that happens. Like he's someone where I could see his value sliding like multiple spots uh through the draft like if a couple of these quarterbacks go a little bit earlier than i expected you know and he lands in a shitty spot i'm like travis Etienne's gonna slide down my board so i'm gonna say that right now i have him right here right now because i'm assuming he'll land in a neutral a neutral at least a neutral team uh someone somewhere that's good you know maybe maybe he goes like a like a falcons right which is like not great not horrible uh or maybe he goes to like somewhere else like that uh, but yeah, right now I'm going to have him here. Actually, you know what? No, no. Because he's so freaking risky, like I, I can't do it. I'm going to take Jamar Chase at number five. Uh, and Jamar Chase is my wide receiver one. And, you know, there's a lot of like vitriol and people are big mad on Twitter. Jamar Tr- Chase truthers are mad at Devontae Smith truthers. Devontae Smith truthers are mad at Jamar Chase. Truthers. I have a proposal. Mike. I don't. Can you like both? Because I like both of them. I'm like yeah. a fan of both Jamar Chase and Devonta Will and Devonta Smith, and it seems like not many people can be on that side of the argument. Like these guys are both really good at football. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're both they're both hella good. I, I think Jamar Chase though is in a tier of his own. What he was able to do as a uh, as a true sophomore was incredibly impressive, and he is a big physical receiver. I mean. He, he's not someone that's going to kill you with the routes. You know, he's not like light feet, Jerry Judy, uh, but he's got hands. So in that aspect, he's better than Jerry Judy as well. So he's not Jerry Judy in, in the multiple facets of the game. He is a yak monster. I mean, he's quite physical. I don't know how he will test at the combine. Maybe he goes out there and, and blows us away, kind of like Justin Jefferson did, but I would expect him to not be that fast. I mean, he doesn't look that fast on screen, but he's great at just getting that last minute separation with his physicality. So I'm actually changing my, I'm changing my pick. I'm changing my rank rankings right now as I think through it I'm going to put Jamar Chase at the 1.05 uh ahead of Travis Etienne he's my wide receiver one he's the only wide receiver in my tier one uh in my tier one group of wide receivers and the only one I would consider taking ahead of a running back um but given the draft doesn't happen I just feel like if you're having drafts right now and you do have to draft these players I think it is a lot safer 
your, your value is a lot more protected with Jamar Chase because he's going to get the draft capital and he is like a wide receivers are much more landing spot independent. It still matters, but way less independent, uh, way more independent of landing spot than uh, running back. So I'm going to go with Jamar Chase here. At yeah. And I think also his skill set is going to lend himself to be more independent of landing spot than a lot of other guys, because as you said, he's great after the catch as a true sophomore with all these other guys on the field, he led the, uh, the nation in broken tackles for wide receivers at the 23. He led the nation in yards after contact with 411. Obviously, like yards after contact per reception might be a little bit lower. Like Jawan Jennings was really high up. But the fact that he can put up like 400 yards after contact, which means like, sure, he didn't separate enough to not get touched, but he was getting touched. He was breaking through and he was still busting long plays. It's, it's hard to not like Jamar Chase. And I know I said Rashad Bateman was my wide receiver one. These two are like very, very close for me. I think they have very different skill sets and people may not realize that because Jamar Chase wins a whole lot down the field and he wins a lot after the catch. Whereas Rashad Bateman to me is more of like an Allen Robinson. Like he can go up and high point a ball. He can moss people, great body control. They're just different guys. And it's kind of like a pick your poison, at least in my opinion, who you'd rather have. But uh, it's definitely a good pick there, Jamar Chase. He's somebody that I think, as you said, could really rise his stock during his rookie year, we saw how many rookie receivers broke out this season. And I think the fact that he's kind of like a DJ Moore or like a more skilled Debo Samuel with a better route inventory and can get down the field more, he's going to break big plays here and there, just like a Jonathan Taylor at the running back position and just skyrocket his value. And I think he's going to be like a top 10 to top 15 pick. So the draft cap doesn't be there. I do like the fact that he changed your pick because now I get to take Travis Etienne at the 106. You kind of hit everything that I was going to say as well. Like, He's a burner, right? If he gets into the open field, he's gone. Even in the NFL where guys are faster, I'm not so sure many people are going to catch him unless it's like Isaiah Simmons because he did that at Clemson and that like race with his shirts off in the back of the practice field. But Travis Etienne is just a guy who shot out of a cannon. And he also said he was like afraid to catch passes. He's like, yeah, I would get spooked when the ball came my way. I man, I, I don't know if that's good for your draft stock to tell coaches like you don't you don't know how to go like this with your hands, but he, he cleaned it up a little bit, 48 and 37 receptions over these past two years, respectively. The thing is, though, he's not really a pass catcher in the sense that he's not going to be a weapon. Like, Derrick Henry can catch passes, too. And I'm sure if he was at Clemson, they'd throw the ball to him 40, 50 times a, a season as well. Because when you have somebody that explosive in a college offense, all college is about is getting the ball in your best playmaker's hands. It's not, I guess there's some scheme involved, but when you have guys like Travis Etienne and the receivers this year were not as good as when they had T Higgins and everybody else that has run through Clemson, you just want to get Etienne the ball and we can dump it off to him two yards behind the line of scrimmage. You have great blocking. You can bust a long play. Sure, you're receiving numbers and your yards per reception, yards after reception are going to look great and a lot more inflated. I wouldn't look at his pure receiving numbers and be like, oh, he's a better receiver than Javante and Najee Harris because the numbers are higher. You got to realize what type of place he's being utilized in. That's not to say he's going to drop every pass that's thrown him in the NFL. I just think that seeing that he was used in the screen game a lot in college does not necessarily translate to him being a passing down specialist like Jamal Charles, who you kind of brought up the comp with at the next level. I think he's going to be more of a one to two down guy, maybe like a Raheem Mostert, like we've seen in San Francisco, who does rely on those bigger holes. And I think Travis Etienne in that system is going to be great because he doesn't necessarily have the same patience as these other guys like a Najee or a Javante. But if the hole is there, he's going to hit it. He's going to be gone. And he's going to take it to the house. So that's what we'll take at the 106. And Mike, I'm going to leave you with the decision of if you're going Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, or another receiver. Because I think the running backs, or maybe even a tight end, but I think the running backs after Travis Etienne kind of fall off a cliff pretty uh, pretty fast. Yeah, I, I, I just kind of like thought about this in my head, though, before we move on, on Travis Etienne. He's kind of, I mentioned Jamal Charles' attention, but like Jamal Charles is like, you know, the GOAT. So we're not going to compliment him, but he's kind of like a Chris Johnson, right? Like, I mean, Chris Johnson was a, was a smaller guy as well coming into league and kind of like that one cut burst up, uh, like long speed track star. Um, so Chris Johnson found, obviously found a lot of success. He had that 2K yard season um, and then had like a couple, a couple of great seasons, right? His rookie year, his sophomore year and his junior year. Uh, all had like you know 1200 1300 plus yards um so it was a was a stud for like three years i I wouldn't be surprised to see him kind of like fall into that type of role and chris johnson i don't i don't remember how good of a receiver chris johnson was i don't don't think he was i'm looking right now his most receptions ever obviously i just said don't look at raw numbers but like 57 44 50 43 he lined up out wide like he was out wide a little bit i don't think travis Etienne's gonna bring that to the table but when you're that explosive you will catch passes out of the backfield yeah, so uh, that's an interesting one to think about. Um, so with 107, I think this is where 
this is where the draft really gets interesting. Like you said, you know, you've got the, the top running backs are gone. You've got what, in my opinion, is the only tier one wide receiver in Jamar Chase off the board, right? So now you can go a lot of ways, right? And this is where this is where you're going to start considering, like, needs a lot on, on your team. And I know people always say, like, oh, always draft the, the BPA. I think that's a, that's a crock of shit because, like, BPA, like, what the hell does that even fucking mean? It means in your own rank. So if you rank someone higher, then I guess take that guy. But nobody fucking knows what BPA is. So here's, like, where I start to consider, like, what my team needs are. And if it's close, I'm not saying, like, punt on an elite player to take like a position you need but if if it's close this is where the tiebreakers really start stepping in right and you know for me uh the reason why i have tiers is it helps me make these types of decisions so my tier one wide receivers are gone right my my tier one and tier two running backs are now gone um so i'm going to be looking at my tier two quarterbacks uh before i look at wide receivers because I, i i really value running backs and quarterbacks before wide receivers in almost like any any draft that i do just because of how replaceable it is and and how easy it is to return value so i've fought with this decision like quite a bit actually and you know i think the popular decision here will be zach wilson and if zach wilson goes like top two top three he will absolutely go here for me as well uh, but for now, I, I really like Trey Lance. So I'm going to take Trey Lance at the 107, and I'll explain why, right? And I, I fully recognize that this is a very risky pick. You know, he played basically one season at really shitty competition, um, but he was pretty outstanding for that one season. He's a raw player for sure, but he provides the upside that I talk about, the Konami code upside. Aside from Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields, Trey Lance is that guy. And if anything, I could make the argument that Trey Lance offers even more rushing upside than both Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields. He is that type of player, uh, that type of football player. Now, is he the most, uh, the greatest passer ever? No. Like, is he the greatest uh, football IQ? I don't fucking know, man. I don't, I don't, I don't have a look into this guy's brain. In the FCS, it doesn't take too much of an IQ to tear it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But he is absolutely electric on the ground. I mean, he rushed for 1,100 yards. Uh, in his second year uh, and 14 touchdowns. He went, you know, passed for 2,800 and 28 touchdowns, no interceptions. Really, like, aesthetically pleasing line. Like, that year that Allen Robinson had 1,400 yards and 14 touchdowns on the down, yeah. oh, that looks nice. And you see this guy, 2,800 yards, 28 touchdowns. And yeah. I, I just enjoyed looking at that. <laughs> yeah, so he, he was an absolute stud. And and he, I, I do think he's going to get the draft capital. I mean, there was, there was legitimate discussion last year about Trey Lance QB1. And that was by like a lot of the talking media heads. Daniel Jeremiah, a big personality there uh, in the NFL draft circles. He loves Trey Lance and he loves Zach Wilson now too. I mean, I'm sure he loves everybody. Uh, but, you know, Trey Lance was getting that hype. So I'm not that concerned about his draft capital. I do think he'll go in like the top 10. And, you know, he's someone that film grinders love. Like they talk about his traits and I'm not a film grinder. And, you know, once Noah starts grinding that film in the off season, you know, I'm sure we can touch back on this prospect some more, but I really like the upside here. And I'm take, making this draft pick fully recognizing that the floor may not be there, right? He might, he's going to be a project, but you know who else was project? Jalen Hurts. But the second he stepped on the field, what do you do? He fucking made plays. because That's what playmakers do. Okay. And you need to absolutely swing for Konami quarterbacks, guys that provide you that rushing upside, because that is where the league is going. Like the, the, the boomers that are still trying to hang on to statute quarterbacks. I'm sorry. You guys are going to just keep losing your leagues because that's not where the league is going. That's not where fantasy is going. You need the Konami quarterbacks and the whole like, Oh, they don't last as long. Oh, they, they get hurt more. Buddy, the fucking league is changing, right? The leagues are changing. These guys are not getting hit as much. Russell Wilson has laid the blueprint for how to succeed as a running quarterback, how to avoid hits. Like, look at Kyler Murray, man. Like, this guy does not take hits. He's sliding way in advance to make sure he doesn't get popped. So, like, and, like, you know, the injury thing, like, we've I've gone through it in my thread. It's, it's a fallacy. So, I got to take the swing here. And if anything, if anything, this would probably be the floor of where I take a Trey Lance because – assuming he gets a draft capital, I mean, if, if he goes anywhere early, I could easily see myself taking him ahead of like a Javante Williams, a Travis Etienne, and really get up there into those top five picks uh, ahead of a Jamar Chase even potentially. So that's where I'm at. I, I, I'm a big fan of Trey Lance. I'm, I know last time when I launched my ranks, I had Zach Wilson ahead, but I've had some time to kind of really think about this. And I think the upside is just uh, is, is a little bit too good to pass up for someone like a Trey Lance. Have you heard of any comps for Trey Lance? Have you ever seen any on Twitter for him? I have not. I have, I have not one. I'm not Trey sure Lance. if anybody's going to like it. Um, I'm sure people that are on the far right won't. I think he's kind of like Colin Kaepernick. Right? He's got the same exact build, and he's a very good runner of the ball. 
and he throws fucking darts. He might not be the most accurate guy, but he throws it like yeah. a damn baseball, and that ball comes out of his hand. It just jumps out of it. I was watching some of his tape. We subscribed to, like, Dynasty Nerds earlier today, so I'm like, okay, I'll watch this guy play South Dakota or some bullshit. He made this one throw. I probably can't put it on the screen because I don't know how to screen record and all that, but he threw it down the sideline to the right while, like, rolling out to the left in double coverage, dropped it in a bucket, and the receiver dropped it. So, like, that doesn't go on a stat line. <laughs> that shit was him. It brought a tear to my eye. And looking at the fact that you, you know, you said he might be um, a riskier guy because the downside is the fact that he might not be that good because he's played in the FCS and he played where Carson Wentz played. And he sucks and he played where Easton Stick played. And that guy can't get on the field either. But I also think that he has a higher floor than most people recognize because even like Jalen Hurts, like what you said, the guy's throwing, you know, he's completing 50% of his passes in the NFL with a depleted receiver core, still like a top 12, top five quarterback on some weeks at the end of the season. I think Trey Lance can run almost as well as Jalen Hurts. He has a bigger arm than Jalen Hurts. If he gets the draft capital, he can step on the field day one. All it's going to take is one of those games where he has 120 rushing yards and a touchdown, and he throws a touchdown in like 107 passing yards. Like, okay, this kid is here to stay. And I think it's not really a bold take because you can't hold me accountable for it. But I think of all the quarterbacks in the class, I would not be surprised if Trey Lance one day is just like the quarterback one out of all of them. And it sounds crazy, but nobody thought that Josh Allen or Lamar Jackson would be better than Baker Mayfield either. And obviously Trevor Lawrence is probably the safest pick and the safest prospect in this class. But if Trey Lance's upside is what it looks to be, and he can fully put on display a skill set where he rushes for 800 yards and throws for 3,500 yards and like 40 total touchdowns, I know those are pretty lofty numbers. But I honestly don't think it's it's too unreasonable to think that. And the fact that you can get a guy like that at, what, the 107, I think that's a great value. Obviously, things will change based on draft capital. But if he goes to a team like Washington or a team like Carolina who needs a quarterback or somehow mm-hmm. like Atlanta, I don't know. I'd probably take him 104, 105 in that range, maybe even higher, like you said, ahead of a guy like Javante Williams. But because you took him, I'm kind of forced to take Zach Wilson, who I currently have ranked ahead of Trey Lance, but they're very close for me. Uh, Zach Wilson out of BYU kind of had the season that Trey Lance had last year where he came out of nowhere and just blew up. His arm talent is, it's incredible. I know he doesn't really have the overwhelming Konami code ability because he's one of those guys who's not always going to run the ball. He's going to scramble, 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 throw it fucking 9,000 yards downfield and put it in a bucket to one of their faceless receivers. He is, I don't want to make the comp to Russell Wilson, uh, but I think it's like, cool to make comps just so you know like if you haven't watched him what he's kind of like like stylistically he's like Russell Wilson because as you said Russell Wilson's a guy who doesn't want to get hit a lot and when Zach Wilson does roll out he's a guy who will slide because he knows he's not going to want to take those hits and a crew on his body he's a bigger guy 6'3 around 210 215 but he's smart when he's running the ball but I also think like a Russell Wilson he would rather extend plays and make plays deep down the field through improvising than pick up those yards in the ground so I think because of that he might have a slightly lower floor than Trey Lance in terms of adding rushing stability to his game. But I think in terms of arm talent and deep accuracy, there was a tweet. I don't know if it was if it was like even about Zach Wilson. I'm not sure. But it was like talking about his deep accuracy and he's completed or like his on ball, his on target deep percentage is like 82%. Comparing that to Patrick yeah. Mahomes is like 35%. Like he just, he has a great arm. That's all I can say about him. And I think you know, in a day and age, like with the Konami code quarterbacks really taking over, it's hard to rank a guy who is most notably known for his arm and not so much his legs as high as I'm ranking a guy like Zach Wilson. But I really do think that if he lands in a good spot, like in Atlanta with the Julio Jones and uh, Russell Gage and Calvin Ridley and Hayden Hurst there with all those type of weapons, um, an air raid type of attack, I think he would do really well at the next level. And he just seems to be, although not a pure Russian quarterback, somebody that will translate to the next level because they do have the requisite speed and the ability to throw on the run that will lead to success in the NFL. I like how you snuck in uh, Russell Gage there as a weapon. Yeah, I put him <laughs> Ridley because I was low on him going in the season. Yeah. Um, look, I think the important thing to take away here is you don't have to rush for 1,100 yards to provide Konami code upside. Like Joe Burrow, you know, he provides Konami code. He, he provided 23% of his production in his first year through, through the running on the ground. He was a QB 13 overall. Uh, and Zach Wilson... Ken has he has the ability to run and be mobile and escape. So that's the key thing there. There's like he's not a he may not be a Justin Fields, he may not be a Trey Lance, but he has that ability. And, and having that ability is key. And I have Zach Wilson immediately after Trey Lance as well. So if you didn't take him out, I would have taken Zach Wilson. What he's been doing this year has been absolutely impressive. And I know I laugh about Zach Wilson QB2 all the time because I, I do think Justin Fields is kind of in that in that tier of his own. But what uh what 
Zach Wilson has done this year has been nothing short of spectacular. I mean, I've watched some of the throws he's made, dropping in a dime, like you said, to no-name receivers. BYU as a team, like, not very good. They don't play in a great conference either, not against great competition, but that doesn't matter because his teammates also stink. So that's when, like, that that conference argument loses a little bit of the, the luster for me. Uh, when it comes to quarterbacks, I mean, your 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 teammates stink and your opposition stinks, so it's like kind of a bit of an equalizer. Should be doing well, which is what he did is do. Yeah. Better. Whereas like someone like Alabama, like yeah, they play in a good conference, but like I mean, they fucking stop everybody because the, their talent gap with even within conference is so wide, right? So that's why I, I don't knock players as much. Guys like Trey, Trey Lance, guys like um, uh, guys like Zach Wilson for that. So I really love that pick and. Kind of like you said, man, it, depending on where these guys go, if both these guys end up like top six picks, for example, right, we're going to shoot them up our draft boards, right? It, are, would you take, let's say Trey Lance and Zach Wilson, you know, both go uh, after like Trevor Lawrence and, and maybe even ahead of Justin Fields, right? Let's say they all go in like the top six picks. Where would you be looking at grabbing like a Trey Lance and a Zach Wilson? I think they would all have to be top five for me. The only non-quarterback positional player that I would take ahead of them probably Najee Harris, just because I really do believe in his skill set and everything like that, like that. But as you said, like the quarter quarterback position is so it's so important in super flex leagues. If you don't have three, you don't have one. If you don't have two, you basically have zero. So having a guy like Zach Wilson or a guy like Trey Lance or the top two, as we mentioned before, it's going to be extremely valuable. Like people were still getting second round picks for Dwayne Haskins this past off season, because when you don't have three quarterbacks, you don't feel safe because, Oh, what if one guy gets hurt in the bye weeks, I'm going to be screwed because I can't put anybody on my bench into my super flex spot. So yeah, I, I mean, if the draft capital is there, it's going to be hard to take any skill position player ahead of a quarterback just because, like, I feel like what we saw last year with the running back class, Dobbins going to Baltimore and Akers going to the Rams and Jonathan Taylor going to Indy and basically every landing spot being perfect. I could see the same thing happen for quarterback this year. Like, we know Trevor Lawrence is going to Jacksonville. And then the other teams that need quarterbacks are, like, the Washington football team who has pretty good weapons, the Carolina Panthers who have good weapons, the Atlanta Falcons who have good weapons, those three other quarterbacks could land in those three spots and they could easily be just like the top four picks in rookie drafts because they're just perfect landing spots with good offenses and great weapons surrounding them. Yeah. The, the quarterback landscape is about to change. And I think that's one key take we got to take away from this class. This class is going to be very talented and sure. Many of them may bust, right? But that's not going to matter because you're not going to see them bust when the value hits uh, the existing incumbent quarterbacks. Like if you're, if you have quarterbacks, that are like in risky situations, guys like a Teddy Bridgewater, right? Guys like that, Drew you know, Lock too. Well, Get them out Drew of Lock, guys like a Drew Lock, and those teams are in the like double digit first rounds with some capital. You should be fucking shitting your pants because those those values can plummet real quick from like a second round pick to nothing. Man. I think Zach Wilson is going to go to the Denver Broncos the way you say it. Six, three white. We'll see how big his hands are. <laughs> and the fact that we were ranking or not, we, but like everybody was ranking drew lock as like a top 15 dynasty quarterback Insane. just because of the weapons surrounding him. Insane. Imagine an actually good quarterback in Zach Wilson landing there and where people will rank him. So it's yeah. going to have to be a top four rookie pick because people are going to see him as a top 12 guy because he has Cortland Sutton, Noah Fant, uh, Jerry Judy and all these weapons surrounding him. Yeah, so so be be careful. If you have quarterbacks in risky situations, dump them. Dump them and just unload that risk because the quarterback landscape is going to change. We just listed off four quarterbacks going in the top eight picks, and there's there's another one down there, Mac Jones, who just won the national championship. So I would be concerned. I would definitely unload a lot of those guys, you know, Matt, the Matt Ryans of the world, uh, even. Like, you know, he's not that old yet. He's 36, but he doesn't look that great, uh, in my opinion. Um, so, you know, Teddy Bridgewater, Matt Ryan, Ben Roethlisberger, uh, all these types of guys, you know, Drew Locke, you mentioned him, who are some other like stinky quarterbacks, uh, Drew Sam, Brees, Dar I think it's Sam Darnold, I wouldn't be surprised if he stays for like one more year, but yeah, that, yeah, Sam, Sam Darnold, uh, for example, right. These are all guys that are Jimmy super... Garoppolo, huge one. I think Jimmy, Garoppolo. oh yeah, Jimmy Garoppolo. That's a, that's a fantastic one. Like these guys, these fringe quarterback twos that people are hanging on to dump them. Dump them and get, like, if you can get a first, fantastic. But if you can get a second, that's a W. And I don't care what you paid for. I don't care if you paid a first for it. Don't get stuck in uh, in sunk cost fallacy, right? I don't care what you paid for it. Just try and get something out of it now because once these quarterbacks start landing, like, nothing plummets values like quarterback and running back landing spots. Like, wide receiver is a little bit different, right? Because you got to be good, and, and they're, they can be fe fe feeding more than one. But when quarterbacks land, and especially talented quarterbacks land, 
you are going to see values absolutely take a dump. So yeah, get ahead of the game. Way, like how much higher can Jimmy Garoppolo's value from now until the draft rise or even after Zero. the draft, like his value is not going to rise if they don't bring in a quarterback, but if no. they do bring in a quarterback or sign one or anything like that, his value is going to absolutely plummet. And his contract yeah. can be like, I think he, they can get out for like minimal dead cap after next season. So what you're getting one more year of like the quarterback 24 in the season, he can't stay healthy. Just sell now if you can. Yeah. I mean, there, there is zero upside to Jimmy Garoppolo's value. Uh, none, none whatsoever. Even if he stays, like, I mean, the guy got a freaking bench for like Nick Mullins and, and uh, CJ Beathard, CJ Beathard uh, at some point this day, this year. So yeah, get out of those guys as soon as you can get whatever you can, because the second round pick, you know, we're not going to go into second round picks this episode, but we'll probably do a second round uh, deep dive later. There's a lot of talent there that you can swing on. So don't be shy to grab a couple of those guys. Okay. So now that those top quarterbacks are gone, you could make a case for Mac Jones here, uh, but this is where I'm going to use the tiering system again. It's going to swing back into the wide receiver position for me. And I'm going to take Rashad Bateman. Love uh, that. I fucking love this guy. Big, big fan of Rashad Bateman. I, I, I'm not a film guy, but of the film that I did see, he was the one that made Tyler Johnson pretty irrelevant. Uh, and to back it all up, he has all the analytics, all the numbers. You know, breakout age broke out in his freshman year despite playing beside uh, Tyler Johnson. He took that up to the next level in his sophomore year. In his junior year, this team took a dump but numbers are still kind of there and supporting him. Uh, but, you know, he's got the juice. You know, people, the one number one knock against Tyler Johnson for everyone was that, dude, this guy's got no juice. And he proved it because he fucking bailed on the combine, couldn't do anything, and everyone just, like, left him for dead, right? But we will not have that issue with Rashad Bateman. Rashad Bateman is the prototypical size. He is big enough to hold that alpha wide receiver role. He's 6'2", 210 pounds, very similar build to T Higgins, who you guys know I was a massive, massive fan of, except I think he is way more athletic. He has the jets. He can burn people. Like he can burn you on the deep ball pretty, pretty damn well. So uh, he's got that big play upside, but he's also like a physical receiver. I mean, I've liked everything I've seen from him. He crosses all the analytical boxes. You know, there's, there was a debate uh, in the off season. A lot of people came out and said, Hey, Rashad Bateman's a wide receiver one, not Jamar chase. I wasn't that spicy. Uh, because I saw Jamar Chase there, but there was a discussion and that talent didn't go away, right? He had a, a little bit of a down year coming back. I thought he could have just opted out, but he's so still he did, a baller. I think he did opt out and then he came back in because the yeah. Big Ten was like an absolute mess. Yeah, the Big Ten fucking shat on everybody, so I'm not going to hold that against him, but I think Rashad Bateman is a day two, early day two pick, um, and he fits in a lot of good places, and I think you're going to be able to get him where we're talking about right now, like the 109. It's not even like it's not even like, you know, we, we made really bad picks, right, leading up to this. But you can absolutely get him in this range. And at the 109, I'm going to be excited to press the draft button on, on Rashad Bateman. Yeah, I think the biggest difference between a guy like Bateman and Jamar Chase is the fact that Bateman doesn't really bring too much yak ability to the game. But I also think, like other receivers that we've seen before, like Teagans was decent in yards after the catch this year. In college, when you're being thrown too deep down the field all the time, your yards after catch per reception numbers aren't going to be as inflated as a guy like maybe Jamar Chase or Devonta Smith, who's used shorter intermediate game and can run after the catch. That's not to say I think he's a great yards after catch receiver because he hasn't been using that fast of the game. I just think the difference between him and Chase comes down to that. And a lot of the top end receivers we're seeing now, like a, an A.J. Brown, like a Justin Jefferson, like a C.D. Lamb, all these young guys, they're blowing up because they're great after the catch. And I think because Bateman doesn't necessarily bring that to the table or in spades like a Chase does is why most people have him as the number two. But we can't forget guys like Allen Robinson, guys like Michael Thomas, guys like even DK Metcalf. They're not necessarily yak receivers. They're just really good at what they do. And I think Rashad Bateman really conglomerates there, congeals everything into one, except for the yak ability. And as you said, like he's somebody who has fantastic hands. I know he has a little bit higher of a drop rate than you would want out of somebody who has great hands. But when you're being thrown to in contested situations uh, and you're making some of those catches and you're missing a few of those opportunities, I think when you make those catches more often than not, I have faith in you that you have good hands. Great body control, as I said, reminds me of a guy like Allen Robinson. I would say he reminds me of a guy like Devontae Adams, but that's fucking crazy to say after the season that he had. But to me, he just seems like a guy who's going to be a very, very good X receiver on the outside who is going to be an elite red zone weapon because he does have the quicks in the short area um, footwork and whatever you need to go up and high point a ball, but also lose a DB inside the 20 and inside the 10. So 
for me, he's my wide receiver one. Him and Chase are very close. And I think getting him at the 109, as you said, like the value in this class is ridiculous. And looking down on my list, I'm not sure if we're going to get Rondell Moore, or Jalen Waddle, even in the first round. The fact that you can get that type of talent or even like a Kenny Gainwell and even like a Mac Jones in the early second just shows you guys that this early in the process where other guys aren't even raising up yet, like an Olave and a Diami Brown after the athletic testing, just shows you go out and get those second round picks. Because when it comes down to it, like selling Odell Beckham for the 110, 111 might be like, fuck, I'm selling Odell for the 110, 111. But when you see it as, oh, I'm selling Odell for Rashad Bateman, give me Bateman every day of the week. Now, going into the 110, I do believe we have the hottest topic of Twitter, the lightest man in the world, Devonta Smith. It's... It's tough to argue the facts. The facts are he's a senior to Claire with a late breakout. He's a little bit older and he's very light. I understand the risks that come with drafting Devonta Smith. I don't care about the risks that come with drafting Devonta Smith because when I watch this kid play and it might be stupid of me to completely, I'm not completely ignoring all this stuff because he is my wide receiver three of the bunch, but it's, it's hard to not like what you see. I mean, the only thing he doesn't bring to the table is the ability to run through tackles, but he can evade tackles. He can outrun DBs and then not get touched. Like his yards after contact for reception numbers aren't great. The thing is he's not getting contacted because he's outrunning defensive backs and he's creating space. So the in-depth numbers aren't necessarily going to look as great as you maybe would expect, but you got to take things into context, right? I mean, 51.7% of his yards did come after the catch. A very minuscule amount came after contact, which means he's not getting contacted, but he's still creating a bunch of his plays after the catch. He's used in the screen game a lot. He is not a screen game re- game receiver in the sense that that's the only way he's going to produce. We all watched the national championship game. This guy, for some reason, I mean, Ohio State was putting like linebackers on him for whatever reason. It was garbage. But I mean, prior to this season, I know last year watching college football playoff and stuff like he was just a deep ball monster who played bigger than his size. Like I never knew before this year, how small he was at 175 pounds. If you were to ask me, I would say, oh, yeah, he's about like six foot, like 200. Like he's a pretty built guy. He plays that size. He isn't that size. But I just think when you when you watch, when you put on the film and you just watch this guy or you just put on a, any college football game where Alabama's playing, you just see that he's an alpha in every sense of the word, except the three numbers that show up on a scale. Yeah, look, I mean, when it comes to analytics, you know, what people don't understand is like, just because he doesn't, like meet certain requirements doesn't mean he stinks you know like mm-hmm. he can still be a really good player he can still go in the nfl and excel the reason why i don't have him ranked as highly is because I, I i think very highly of some of the other players in this class so like given that trade-off i'm just always going to go for the safer option but like there's no way to undersell what he's been able to achieve this year i mean 117 receptions 1800 yards 23 tutties like and he was the he was the best top producer last year as well as a junior i would have liked it a lot more if he came out last year um but you know it doesn't mean that that he sucks now that he didn't he's going to be an interesting case and you know it's funny that we're like kind of you're like defending your pick here and we're at the 110 when chances are he's going to be gone by the wide 10 i mean there's going to be someone out there that has him as a wide receiver one i mean ray gq front of the show has him as a wide receiver one a lot of film people probably have him as a wide receiver one heisman winner you know first wide receiver uh to win the heisman in like is it ever or like since 1991 no, like or something like 20 something or 30 or 91 yeah 30. yeah and like 30 years uh you know won the blit in the cough for the best wide receiver won the national championships the problem with all listing all these accomplishments is none of them actually translate to like nfl production per se See, randy they're moss great. never won the heisman so they're yeah they're great, they're, they're, great. they're all great statistical achievements but like if you're coming in an argument, please don't bring that shit in because it doesn't matter when it comes to PPR scoring, which is what we care about, right? So, but he has been impressive. I mean, the eyeballs when I watch him play, I'm like, damn, this guy's impressive. But did you have you noticed that like he runs primarily like out of the slot, right? Like at least in the national championships, like he was running out of the slot and just burning linebackers a lot. He did take some snaps out wide, uh, and then obviously took some screens as well. But he was running a lot out of the slot from what yeah. I saw. This past game he did, but his junior year he was. I think at least from what I said, he was on the outside a lot and just running deep routes. I think he kind of elevated his game and I think they want to use him in more of a yak type of role. Ever since Jalen Waddle went down, he kind of put that on display. And I think he really built up his game from his junior or senior year. Like they talked mm. about all the time in the broadcast, like, Oh yeah, he really improved his acceleration and you don't really notice it until you see him get to the edge and like defenders who look like they have good pursuit angles don't catch up to him. So I think maybe he kind of, 
he, he maybe like a Justin Jefferson where he went like from outside to slot and now people think of him as a slot receiver and then we saw him dominate on the outside in the NFL we might be seeing a similar transgression for Devonta Smith maybe because they just found he was better at that role uh, this past season but I don't think that's to say he can't play the outside role I mean maybe with his size it's gonna be tougher in the NFL but with his speed we'll see what he tests at I wouldn't be surprised if he puts up like high four threes and like four three four three nine or like low four fours because he does look like an absolute burner from what i've seen recently yeah yeah that's interesting um but that'll be a debate we have all off season i have one not... question for you for devonta smith i'm not sure if you know it off the top of your head but analytics wise i know henry ruggs is like a bum and everything but like was henry ruggs profile coming out and declaring as a junior and then being like a top 15 pick were there a lot more red flags with henry ruggs than there a are lot more with devonta smith Oh yeah, way more, way more. Okay. I mean, like the production, production is the number one red flag, and Henry Ruggs never produced, uh, and on all three of his years. So, being an early declarer is like is great and all, but if you don't produce, like that's the number one red flag. Uh, so Devonta Smith produced as a junior. He actually, he at least has a breakout age. Mm-hmm. Henry Ruggs has no breakout age. Uh, so he still doesn't have a breakout age one year into the NFL. Yeah, he still doesn't have a breakout age. So yeah, Henry Ruggs way more red flags. I would have taken Devonta Smith over Henry Ruggs easily if he had declared last year. I would still take him. Uh, like, you know, comparable comparatively right now. So, yeah, way more red flags for Henry Ruggs uh, than uh, Devonta Smith because the only thing Henry Ruggs are going for him is, is the Underwear Olympics, which matters the least when it comes to wide receivers. Uh, so next up, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch it up a bit here because I, I want to talk about this dude. I'm not sure if Noah has him in his ranks. Uh, but at the 111, uh, normally I think I'd, I'd probably go with the Rondell more here, uh, but I'm going to go with Kyle Pitts. This is where I feel comfortable enough uh, not not comfortable. I feel I feel risky. I feel I feel risky enough to take a swing on a tight end in a non tight end premium league in the back half of the first. I mean, there's no denying that Kyle Pitts is a once you know once in a few years type of prospect in what terms of what he's able to do. He's basically a receiver that plays a tight end position. You know, I'm I'm excited to see how he tests at the combine. I have no doubts that it'll be quite impressive. Although I had no doubts about Hunter Bryant. Uh, last year and that that didn't work out <laughs> totally went up to the blocking dummy and just straight military yeah. <laughs> yeah so we'll see how that works out but I, I really would hesitate against taking uh Kyle Pitts any earlier than this I mean this is even early because think about it we don't we still haven't gone to Rondell Moore like Seth Williams Deami Brown Mac Jones another quarterback down there but I, this is the point where I would feel risky enough if you need a tight end and you want to swing take a swing on Kyle Pitts here Chances are he might even be gone before here. You know, he might be going ahead of a Rashad Bateman or whatever, but I feel like this is a good point. This would be the upper limit of where I take him. Uh, he's he's incredible. He's a tier one tight end. The reason why I'm so risk averse tight ends is because like, you just got to wait. I mean, they don't produce, uh, they don't produce out the gate. And even when they do produce like Evan Ingram, his rookie, he put up like 700 yards. That was like the Holy grail of like tight ends. Right. And even look at like Evan Ingram. Now like, he's not doing that great it's just a very risky volatile position tight end is where like i don't want to rely on rookies i want to get veterans i want to get darren wallers i want to get travis kelsey i want to get george kittles uh, i want to get tj hawkinson's you know i want to get the tight ends that have like shown signs of breaking out already and i'm buying them as vets that's why i don't go tight ends often but if i were to do it kyle pitts would be the one i go for and if i were to pick him it'd be at this range of the draft yeah, I also think his downside in terms of value fluc- fluctuation won't necessarily be as big as the picture people are painting just because I know every year it's like, okay, you got to wait for them to produce. They don't produce and then they fall in value. But I think the fact that both TJ Hawkinson and Noah Fant kind of had that similar trajectory where the rookie year were down years and then the offseason people were taking Tyler Higby ahead of them. And then this year they kind of showed out. I think people are going to start to realize, okay, I understand the investment that I'm making with a Kyle Pitts. I'm not going to sell him low. If I can buy him low, sure. But I think the people who are drafting him in the first round um, hopefully are smart enough to realize that the investment will probably take a year to pan out. The only thing is if it doesn't take a year and within the first year, he puts up 700, 800 yards. I think if he were to redraft this, he would probably only go consensus wise only behind maybe the top four quarterbacks, Najee Harris and Jamar Chase, because even in non- tight end premium leagues the advantage you have of having a guy who has the upside of a Darren Waller who I think both you and I have comfortably within the top three dynasty uh, tight ends the advantage of having basically another wide receiver worth of production where your opponent unless they have top three four five guys is getting maybe like five six points a week is absolutely massive and the fact that Kyle Pitts is this move tight end who isn't like Trey Burton who's like 6'1 220 who has the prototypical size has the speed to play on the outside and basically was a wide receiver in college the ability that he's going to bring to the next level 
I think the draft capital is obviously going to be there. If he can put up 600, 700, 800 yards as a rookie and at least show some flashes and the athleticism that he's going to show at the combine, his value might be a little bit more stable than people uh, may, may believe at this point. And I think, you know, the Chargers are the 13th pick. Hunter Henry is a free agent. If he lands in L.A., it's going to be tough for me to not take him inside like the top eight, nine picks because Hunter Henry is basically catch and fall. Zach Ertz specialist with Keenan Allen getting a little bit older and Mike Williams getting RKO'd out of absolutely everywhere. I think Kyle Pitts could be like a legit wide receiver in a tight end role. And that's going to be huge for you in fantasy. Now for the 112. And after the 112, Mike and I are going to go through any guys that were left off on either of our lists. And I have two guys who didn't make the cut based on this being the 112. I have Jalen Waddle and Rondell Moore, and they're extremely close for me. But I also think Mike probably had Rondell Moore inside his top 12. So we're going to talk about him. So I'm going to talk about Jalen Waddle instead. He is somebody who has shared the field with Devonta Smith, with J Jerry Judy, with Henry Ruggs, with a bunch of other guys at Alabama. And I also don't think Jalen Waddle ever really broke out. I think his best year production wise was his freshman year. And he only had like a 17% market share of the receiving yards and like touchdowns. So I don't think he ever really surpassed a 20% dominator rating, but a lot of that can kind of be rationalized away given the context of his situation playing with probably going to be three other first round wide receivers in this season after four games going down uh, to Tennessee in like a kick return situation. He put up 120 yards in every single game this year. I have no doubt that he would have broken out this year. The only concern is his breakout would have been as a junior and he's only one week younger than Devonta Smith. So although Devonta Smith is a senior, they are basically the same age. But when I watch Jalen model play, it's like, not that he's unguardable and not to say he's Tyreek Hill, but the speed he brings is like legit next level. And I think if you were drafting Henry Ruggs inside the top three receivers last year, there's no reason for you to not draft Jalen Waddle in that position this year, because he's basically what we wanted were what people that wanted Henry Ruggs to be good. He's what he is, right? Jalen Waddle brings everything to, to, the, to the table that Henry Ruggs couldn't. Henry Ruggs looked really good at the combine, but he didn't look good on the field. Jalen Waddle is going to look at both and this kid for as cliche it is, he's a gamer, right? He went out there in the college football championship with a bum ankle. I didn't even think he was going to be ready for like the combine or anything. He went out there, he produced. Uh, I know he didn't produce all too well because Devonta Smith took every single reception, took it to the house, but he was out there limping around and still burning quarterbacks over the middle. So I think although he is another guy who is in a little bit of a slighter frame, like sub six foot and like 180 pounds, the dynamism that he brings to the table, returning kicks and being able to win after the catch and win at the catch point as well is why I'm comfortable taking him in the first round. And I think he's going to have the draft capital as well because he's been mocked as a first round pick. And I don't think the injury has done much to deter his value at this point. He's he's small, but he's thick. He's like 5'10", 182. Uh, mm -hmm. So he's got that build. And, you know, people love freaking chasing Tyree Kill, the unicorn. And I just like, I never comp anyone to Tyree Kill because it's stupid. There's only one of him. But like, if if you were to have to choose a comp, like he's way more similar to a Tyree Kill than Henry Ruggs ever was. Like Henry Ruggs is just fast. That's it. And, but like Tyree Kill, where he gets his, why he's so dangerous is he he like accelerates and bursts and ch changes direction within a sh tiny space so quickly. And he you makes people he's look a good route runner. Like when you're that fast, your routes don't have to look like Jerry Judy. No Jerry, Jerry yeah. Judy fast but when you can stop pretty quickly and your cornerback is on his heels you just yeah. have to turn and run and you're like you're going to be open because when you run a four three and you're that explosive i mean that's all you need to do crazy yeah and, and people give him so much respect off the line because like tyree kill is actually pretty lethal off the line with his release and he can absolutely burn you whereas like henry ruggs i don't think many nfl dbs are really worried about getting burned and pressing him on the line because he has no moves like if you look at henry ruggs on the line of scrimmage Defender puts his hands on him and it's over. That routes that routes basically ended, and that's why they're not worried yeah, about hand. Stop watching your hand. How am I going to tell you I'm a fast? <laughs> yeah, but but Tyree Kill, you can't do that because he has like he has like Devonte Adams esque moves. Devonte Adams has the best release in the NFL, Barna. In my in my noob film founder opinion, yeah, we'll give you that. Yeah, Keenan Allen, Devonte Adams, but I think Devonte Adams is the best. Has the best release. Tyree Kill is pretty fucking deadly off the line as well. Henry Ruggs, not that. Jalen Waddle. Uh, he's got something there. So I, I do like Jalen Waddle, but I, I, I mean, I hate betting on outliers in the first round. So I, I just don't see myself uh, drafting him there. But what I will say is Jalen Waddle was not a scrub in his freshman year. You know, he didn't hit the 20% mark, but he had like 17.5% uh, market share of receiving yards as a junior. And he, I mean, sorry, as a, as a freshman, and he was playing 
with, you know, the Jerry Judys and the Henry Ruggs and, and the Devonta Smiths and the Calvin Ridleys, right? So it's not like he was a total bum and did nothing for, for his entire tenure there. And I have no doubts that he would have broken out this year. I mean, Jalen Waddle outproduced Henry Ruggs in, in his freshman year. All right. So and Devonta Smith, he was the yeah, second leading receiver. Yeah. And Devonta Smith. And he was the second leading receiver behind Jerry Judy, who, uh, who I believe won the Blitnikoff that year. Right. So, you know, Jalen Waddle's not a scrub, you know, he, he may not have broken that threshold, but he would have busted out this year. Like he, he, he was on pace. He was the wide receiver one, you know, before he kind of went down, he was having an absolute fucking monster monster season this year and it's, it's a damn shame that he went down because i really would have loved to see what he's able to do i mean he had 100 yards every single game uh except for the ones that he got hurt so i i, I like jillian Watt a lot i think him and rondell Moore, stylistically very similar players very versatile uh smaller guys both really thick really strong both actually really good in contested catch i mean people don't don't really think about that because they're tiny guys, but they can really get up there and climb that fucking virtual ladder and get and get the ball. So I like Jalen Waddle. I, I would not take him over Rondell Moore. And like I said, I probably would have taken Rondell Moore over Kyle Pitts even, but you took Devonta Smith. So it kind of forced my hand to pick uh, Kyle, Kyle Pitts over there. But I do like uh, Jalen Waddle a lot. And he is a punt returner. He's got that versatility. Uh, he is explosive. And he is someone that you can get involved in the backfield. I, whereas I don't think you could have done that with Henry Ruggs. He doesn't have that stop and go that someone like a Jalen Waddle does. And they raced each other. Henry Ruggs and Jalen Waddle raced each other, and they were like toe-to-toe. So I'm not going to be shocked at all when Jalen Waddle goes out. If he's healthy, if he's healthy, I won't be shocked at all if Jalen Waddle goes out and runs a 4-2 or like a like a very high 4-2 or like a super low 4-3. I think that's, that's pretty much what he's going to be. Um, so I, I like that pick. Um, I would have went a little bit differently. I would have went Rondell Moore just because of the, the analytics that he brings. And also, you know, Rondell Moore is also very – uh, very fast and, and just like explosive and brings a lot of those same similar traits, but it was just elite production in in college. So is that the only that guy kind of wraps up in this top twelve that wasn't that didn't make the cut was Rondell Moore because he was the only guy in mine. Yeah, so the only guy that didn't make it uh, for me was Rondell Moore, but also uh, Seth Williams. So okay. I have Seth Williams in my top twelve. I'm a big fan of Seth Williams. I think. He's going a little bit under the radar because his quarterback fucking stinks. Bo Nix is trash. Uh, but if you watch the games and, you know, he's produced at an elite level as a, you know, he has high end uh, production, uh, age adjusted production, uh, as well as, uh, you know, market share of receiving yards. And he's, he's a monster in the, in the TD in the end zone, but he's a monster in the air and he's not an elite route runner. He's not going to like get tons of separation, but we've already seen, how little that matters uh, in the NFL, as long as you can win a certain way. And Seth Williams absolutely can win. Uh, and he is that prototype alpha size. He is, he's fucking huge. Man. Like Seth Williams is, is a beast. So if you guys don't know about Seth Williams, I highly encourage you to go and, and watch some film on him. Uh, but if you just, even just calculate the numbers, you know, he's kind of like Rashad Bateman, you know, six, three, two, 11. They're like him, Rashad Bateman, Seth Williams and Jamar Chase are like the guys that really fit that prototypical mold in this class. And then you have like these other guys that are maybe a bit more landing spot dependent, uh, depending on who you talk to, but just a really, really exciting class. I mean, we didn't even talk about Deami Brown, right? Who, who you guys know, I freaking love. And just every time he's in there on the top of the second round, I'm just going to smash the draft button on him. You got like Chris Olave, uh, who's, who's also like in that like skinny, uh, thin frame, but, a pretty good producer. You got Terrace Marshall who kind of blew up this year with Jamar Chase sitting out. You got Amon Ross and Brown on the USC side. You mentioned Kenneth Gainwell, right? Uh, there's Jamar Jefferson, uh, Elijah Sorry, Moore, Mac. Yeah, Mac Jones, right? And we haven't even talked about Truba Hubbard yet. Right? Truba Hubbard sliding down everyone's boards, but if he gets draft capital, you know, if he gets second round draft capital after he goes out and runs like a four four. It's going to be hard to let him slide out of the second if round. If he has a better right? so, landing spot than Travis Etienne, how far apart do you think – like if Travis Etienne goes to the Jets and Chuba Hubbard goes to San Francisco, how far apart in ADP do you think they'll be? Ooh, that's a good question. I, I don't think – I think ADP-wise, I think Chuba Hubbard will kind of be like a late first mm-hmm. and Etienne will maybe be like a mid first or maybe yeah. like early second for for like a – probably early second for like a Chuba Hubbard and then – like a mid to later first for Travis Etienne. So I think there'll still be a gap just because Etienne, his hype has been building for like 
forever now right mm-hmm. and and one of the most prolific producers in college so and you got guys that love film grinders love him you know analytics guys even love him so you have a lot of people in, in his camp where like truba hubbard basically tanked he should have came out last year that was a mistake in my opinion i don't know Truth. why like i don't know didn't he have like problems with mike gundy too because mike gundy was like wearing all those like yeah he had, he had problems with mike gundy like he should have just came out he had, when you rush for two thousand yards you can go in the nfl fucking go like don't make that mistake uh so <laughs> Yeah, Truba Hubbard is an interesting one. So a lot of interesting names that we didn't even freaking cover. And that's how deep the class is. Obviously, lots will change with draft capital. There'll be guys that we didn't even think about that got high draft capital that we'll have to look into later on. But I'm pretty confident in our first round picks here. Like, I think these guys are going to be relevant. And these are the guys you want to study. And as I always say, man, like, don't fucking waste a bunch of time looking at sleepers. Like, spend the time on these guys. Understand the first round, the second round. Understand, you know, where you want to go. What are the landmines you want to avoid? Because that's that's where the draft is lost. You know, that that's where that's where you get a fucking film grinder last year taking Henry Ruggs like in the first round as like the wide receiver three or some shit. And now now they're now their draft is lost because they didn't they pass on a T. Higgins and they passed on Justin Jefferson and they pass on all these guys. So make sure you get this part of the draft correct. It's it's really, really important. And you know, we'll get back to you guys probably with like a second round mock as well. And we'll we'll have a ton, ton more mocks throughout the offseason as like new events trigger. Uh, so make sure you guys stick around for that. Uh, anything else? I think that's about it. All right, cool. So if you guys enjoyed, that's all we got for you. Make sure you smash that subscribe button. Uh, hit the thumbs up for Noah's thumbnail game, which is just going through the fucking roof. Stonks up on the BBB channel thumbnails, uh, courtesy of your boy, Noah. And, you know, follow us on Twitter. Follow Noah. Follow myself. Follow the Bunk Beds channel. Bunk bed underscore um, is that's on Twitter. And we're putting out a ton of content, man. Like this off season, it's going to be fun. You know, last off season, we had to deal with like COVID and we had to spend a bunch of time talking about that shit, which no one wants to talk about. Hopefully we don't have to deal with that again, unless it's fucking mega strain from like the UK starts killing people. Who the fuck knows? <laughs> I haven't even heard about that yet. So I'm, I'm just keeping my mind off of that. <laughs> Focusing solely on the 2021 class. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna do a lot of 2021 class content. So don't be worried about that. I'll probably even mix in a lot of Devi as well uh, on the Market Watch Mondays channel if you guys are interested in that. Uh, just stick around, man. Follow us, stick around, and just just get that notification on because as we launch videos, you're going to be wanting to be uh, making sure you're up to date. And we're gonna try and do our best to keep you guys up to date as we did last year. And you know the goal is always to do better this year than last year. We'll probably fuck that up, but, you know, we're going to try our best. So that's all we got for you guys. See you guys next week.